Welcome to the Christian Worship Hour with Pastor Harold E. Salem. The mission of the Christian Worship Hour is to share the good news of the gospel with a lost world and to encourage and equip Christians to pray for our families and our nations. Please join with us and the members of our church family as we study the incomparable Word of God. And stay tuned to learn more about how you can be a part of God's amazing plan to reach the world. We hope you will be blessed by today's program. I'm Pastor Salem, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Worship Hour. And we're always happy when the weekends come around because that means all over the world we're going to gather together around the feet of Jesus and worship the Son of God. And um, we know that there are many who will be coming to know the Lord during that service. And others will be encouraged and comforted, and we just thank God for the open door. Before we have our message, though, I want to read just a couple of three letters. The first one is from Sheridan, Wyoming. And this person writes and says, I'm struggling with something that I feel is really bad. It's upsetting me so much as I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. And so here's a lady, and uh, she has heard that somebody's told her she's committed the unpardonable sin. Well, now I'm going to tell you that's impossible. To, it's impossible to commit the unpardonable sin today. Because the unpardonable sin is mentioned in Matthew 12, 24, in Mark 3, verse 22, and Luke 11, verse 14. And it has to do with when Jesus was here and he performed his miracles and the scribes and the Pharisees said that he was doing all of this work through the power of Beelzebub. And that was an evil Satan, a a spirit of Satan. And so they ascribed the work of the Holy Spirit to Beelzebub. And Jesus says, if anybody does that, they're in danger. He didn't say they committed it. They're in danger of committing the unpardonable sin. But now Jesus isn't here with his miracles, so you don't need to worry. The only unpardonable sin really is unbelief. They refuse to believe. And uh, then they are eternally lost. Now here's a letter from St. Paul, Minnesota. And this person writes, I have a lot of health issues that used to bother me a lot. I felt like life wasn't really worth living. But after learning about Jesus, I began to feel different about situations. Your show and Jesus allowed me to get the comfort that I need. Now all I do is thank God for Jesus What a relief. Thank you. And, uh, you know, that's what we do when we come to Jesus. He gives us comfort. He tells us in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. Let it not be afraid. And so when you have Jesus, when you take Jesus into your heart, you just make that prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart, take away your sin. He'll give you peace. You may feel something, you may not feel something, you may get goose pimples, you may not, but you will have that peace that passes all understanding. Then there's one other letter we want to read in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. And this person writes, I recently have come back to Jesus from a lot of years going down the wrong highway of life. I recently became disabled, and though I could be bitter, my heart is at peace. I look forward to what God has planned in my life. And so here's a a lady and she writes, and she's been traveling that wrong road and she had something come into her life, a hard thing. And instead of becoming angry with God, she says, I thank God for that because it brought me to Jesus. I have heard so many people thank God that they had a heart attack or they had an accident or something and it brought them to Jesus. That's the big thing. And when you come to Jesus, if you write to us, and I'll give the address at the close of the service, we'll send you a little book, a little Bible study, and it's called The New Song. And this, this month of May, it's about let your light shine. So get your pencil and paper, get ready, and uh, then we can share that later. But now we have a very special friend here, Hank Bowker, and he's got a special announcement to give, so God bless you, Hank. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Folks, I have an exciting announcement to make. Yesterday was the official release date and the premiere of the Christian Worship Hour film, Heart of a Shepherd, featuring the life and ministry of our pastor, Dr. Harold E. Salem. 
It's a chronicle of Pastor's life from his youth throughout his pastoral career and then his longtime affiliation with the Christian Worship Hour. Heart of a Shepherd is an inspiring, heartwarming story, but more significantly, the film carries the most important message on earth. You may be a believer, but, but are not sure how to pass on the good news of Jesus to your family and friends. This film is a great way to do just that. The Heart of a Shepherd film is now available on DVD from the Christian Worship Hour, and you can order it by sending a free will offering of any amount to the Christian Worship Hour, Post Office Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402, or by ordering it online at www.christianworshiphour.com. Thank you all so much, and God bless. And thank you, Hank. God bless you. And I'm going to ask all of you to pray for this film because it is made up so that people will come to Jesus. It's a story about Jesus, really. And the emphasis is on coming to Jesus and finding him as your Savior and your friend. So I hope you'll pray for this ministry just coming out now, just going out into the world, all over the world in six, six different languages, and pray that God will use it to touch hearts and bring people to himself. That's, that's our prayer. But we're all thinking about Daniel today. Daniel in the lion's den. Boy, I remember going to Sunday school and reading about lions in the, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. And uh, it just always thrilled my soul. And there, so I want to preach about it today. And uh, it's a story about a man whose name was Daniel. And it means his name means God is my judge. And Daniel lived that kind of a life that he stood before God as his judge. And he was careful how he lived and how he, and, and, and that he was trying to be righteous like the righteous judge. We know nothing of Daniel's family or early life, but we do know that he was one of the young people taken captive when Nebuchadnezzar overran Israel. And that took place in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. That is, it was about 605 B.C., not only did Nebuchadnezzar capture the land, but he took the sacred silver and gold vessels from the God's, God's temple. And then he took young men. He took young men that he thought had a special wisdom. And he was the people that are young men he wanted to train in his government. So you have their input. And the, so he took the four young men from Jerusalem. They were about 13 to 15 years of age, so far as we can tell. And in Babylon, they were named. And the names they were given was Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These all young men were without blemish. They were handsome. They had wisdom. They had knowledge. They understood science. And the king wanted them in his palace to have them help and to give, give their input. So the young men, upon arriving in Babylon, were put under the watchful eye of a man named Ashbeth, Ashphaz. And uh, he was the master or chief of the eunuchs. The four Hebrew boys were put under his control. And they were to be there for three years. And then after three years, they go before the king. And the king would talk to them, interview them, and see what he, if he thought they were, uh, really had some, uh, something they could give to the kingdom and ha have help in the kingdom. And these young men were to be favored. And they were to eat food from the king's court, from the king's table and to drink the wine and drink the food. And the first thing Daniel did, that went against their dietary laws. And so he asked the leader, Alphaz, and he asked him if he could have permission that they could just, the young men could just eat vegetables and drink water. And that was granted to him. And so all over all these years, that's just the way it was. And God gave gifts to these young men, and he helped them in their ways. And for Daniel, he had a special gift, and that was understanding visions and dreams, and understanding them and interpreting these visions and dreams. And so at the end of three years, the king found the four Hebrew young men to be superior to all the magicians and enchanters in every matter of wisdom and understanding. They stood out uh, uh, head and shoulders over all of the rest of us. And so they began their work in the kingdom. 
Now it comes that Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And at the appointed time, Daniel interprets the king's dream. And, in the, and uh, then they were loaded with gifts and blessed because they, uh, he was able to give the interpretation of the dream. And this is what happened. There was writing on the wall. They're all having a drunken party. And there's great writing on the wall. Mini, mini, tekel, perez. And they understood, none of the magicians in Egypt could figure it out. And, and Babylon could figure it out. And so Daniel comes. And Daniel comes and he asks for prayer. And he wants to be prayed about it. And then he interprets this dream. He says, he, he says, Mini means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. He tells Nebuchadnezzar, Tekel means you have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. And then he said, Te Perez means your kingdom is divided and you're given to the Medes and the Persians. And for this service, he was clothed in purple and is given a gold necklace and all a great honor. It was a terrible prophecy, but, but, but Nebuchadnezzar could see, here's a man that has wisdom beyond anything we have in, in Babylon. And so he listens to him. But that very night, the interpretation of Daniel's dream came true. And that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. Daniel was in of such stature and influence and wisdom then that Darius could see that he had something special and he gave him a very high place in the kingdom. That is, it was that godly Daniel served under three, possibly, and possibly four different leaders. He served under Nebuchadnezzar, he served under Belshazzar, he served under Darius, and possibly he served under King Cyrus. So look at his high position. Under Nebuchadnezzar, he was chief of the wise men. He was the gate of the king. He was governor over the whole province of Babylon itself. Under Belshazzar, he was made the third ruler of the entire kingdom, only three to rule, and he was one of the third rulers. And under Darius, he was one of three presidents of the kingdom, and Darius even had toyed with the idea of making him a total king of over all of them. President, they called him a president under Darius. Daniel was very humble and very faithful, and so he was true to his leaders, and he was always true and honest. And he began so, consequently, the other people in the kingdom, other kingdom in the, in the palace became very jealous of Daniel. And they want to get rid of him because he's going to be the key man. And they want to do, him away, do away with him. And so they try to figure out anything they could possibly do. But they couldn't put a finger against anything Daniel did. Now, Daniel was a sinner, and he had his sins, but he's the only one in the Bible I know except Jesus who has nothing written down in any sins against him. He was just above reproach, but there was one thing that he, they could get him on, and that was that he worshiped God. And Daniel's proper, he always get, went to the window, and he prayed with a window open, wide open so that all could see and he always faced Jerusalem where that holy city where the temple was. And he prayed. And then they say, and they, could, they knew that, everybody knew that. And so these people that want to put him down, these evil men, they set a trap. And so they go to Darius. And they said, Darius, will you make a law? And make this law that if anybody asks anything from anybody, uh, for, uh, for any gods or any person except you, they'll be put in the di uh, den of lions. And so they know that he's going to, he, they know that Daniel's going to continue praying to his God. And, but Darius doesn't know it, and he doesn't know it's a trap. And so he signs this paper, and he says, if anybody asks of anything uh, other than except me, they'll be put in the den of lions. And so uh, they just, they were just thrilled to death. And then they go to the Darius, and they say, uh, and they told the king just exactly what was happening, and he was praying to God, another God. And Darius knows that he, he's sick, 
He's just sick because he knows that there's one thing that stands, and that is the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. They cannot be broken. They cannot be tampered with in any way. If it says this, and that's exactly what it has to be, and he knows that Daniel is going to have to be cast into that den of lions. And, the, and he's sick at heart, and he wished he, wished he could have died, but he didn't. And so Darius, then he that night, he's up all night, there's no music in the palace, and he prays, and he talks, and he's getting to where the, he's thinking about the God of the Israelites, not so much the God of the, of, the, of the Medes and the Persians, but the God of the Israelites, and he's praying that somehow God will spare them, and the next day he goes to this place, and Daniel is alive, and angels came, and angel came and locked the mouths of the animals, and they were, and there was no way that they could harm Daniel. And the Darius is thrilled to death and thanking God and praising God. Now I want to draw some lessons from this story, and the first thing we see when we read this story is that man, Daniel was a man of integrity. That is, he always kept his word. He was honest as the day is long. He was honest in his private places. He was honest in, in, his, in, in every way he traveled, whether it's open or closed. He was a true, honest man. And that's illustrated in a young Christian man who went to a, to went to a southern university. He made the football team as a starting split end. And he continually was before God and was always saying, Oh, help me in the climax of moments to be honest. I pray for honesty that one of in, man of mark of integrity. I want to be that dear Lord. I'll work on it through all this season and I'll be as honest I possibly can. Help me to have integrity. That's what the young man prayed. And so when the night came, the rival team came that night. It was homecoming, and he was ran his route, and he went into the end zone, and the quarterback threw him a pass, and it was very close to the ground, but, the, but he trapped it. He launched it. He got it, and the referee says, touchdown. And everybody was thrilled to death, but the young man knew that he trapped the ball. And the, those of you that don't know football, it simply means that the ball hit the ground in the hand and got his hands on top of the ball. It hit the ground first. He trapped the ball. He didn't really catch it. And so he went, the young man went to the referee and he said, I have to tell you something. I trapped the ball. I didn't catch it. I trapped the ball. The referee canceled the touchdown and they lost the game. Now, to understand this, you have to think of this. Here's the picture. Here's this one young boy standing all alone. Here's all of his teammates saying, what are you talking about? It was good enough. It was close enough. What's the matter with you, man? Anyway, don't talk like that. And the crowd, they think they've won the game, and now it's snatched away, and they're not happy at all. And this young man says, he, I didn't, I can't take credit for that. I didn't catch the ball. I trapped the ball. Why did he do it? Because he was a man of integrity. Integrity makes us honest. It makes us honest before the whole world. If we stand all alone, we stand with honest to God and be honest to ourselves. And it means honesty. It means integrity means you're honest in the light and you're honest in the dark. You're always honest. Daniel was a man of integrity. And then the second thing I noticed about this, Daniel, Daniel was a man of prayer. Over and over again, we read of Daniel going to God in prayer when he needed help and respect, and when he didn't need help. And I think it's just fine to go to God in time of help. And I remember one man told me when we were, I remember we were in a boat and we were in, uh, out of fishing up in Canada and a storm came up and after we got, we finally got to shore and this fellow, he's a long-legged guy, I saw him, he's across, sitting across in the boat and he said, well, God heard from somebody he ain't heard from, from for a long time. I said, you see, that's all right. When you're in trouble, pray to God, but when you're not in trouble, pray to God. You pray to God whether you're in trouble or not. The trouble doesn't make a bit of difference. And that's the way Daniel was. And he just was, he just wouldn't want, he just, it was three times a day. He went to that window and he prayed. 
Prayer became a great source of stability for Daniel, and it'll give us stability in our life, and it'll help us to be men of integrity and women of integrity. It will help us to live a good, clean life. It'll be because uh, Daniel was a man of prayer, and so you and I need to be a man of prayer. And then the third thing I put down about Daniel was he was true to God no matter what the cost, and it cost Daniel a plenty. Darius does all he can to save Daniel from the den, but he cannot break the law of the Medes of the Persians. So after much agonizing as the day comes to a close, Darius has to call Daniel and he has to put him in the den of lions. And I might add this, they were starving animals, starving lions. The lion's den was a large pit. It was divided by a movable wall that could be pulled up to allow the lions to go from one end of the pit to the other. And so the keeper would put food in one end, and while they went there, he'd put the uh, big uh, wall down, and then he would clean out or whatever he had to do. Then he would raise it up, and they had all over in the, you know, they had the den to themselves. And so Daniel is put in there, and that line is, the wall is down, and he's put in the one side, and then the is closed, and then they raise up that curtain. And the lions can come to Daniel. And they came to Daniel starving to death. And they can't touch him because there's an angel there. An angel of God. And some people think that it was Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. You remember how the three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace? And then they looked in that furnace and they threw, put three men in, but there were four men walking. And the fourth one looked like the son of God or the son of the gods. It could be translated. And they think that maybe that was Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. Maybe Jesus came in his pre-incarnate form. Maybe it was an angel because angels have great power. And at any rate, not one thing could be done. Not one thing could be touched to those men because God was watching over them. And then he is uncovered, and on the rock is taken away. Darius comes, and he is thrilled to death, and he praises God, and he gives praise to God because this angel came to minister. Boy, told, for instance, in Matthew 4, verse 11, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he tempted at least three times, maybe more, and we read that then the devil leaveth him, Behold, angels came, ministered unto him. So now it hears the angel of the Lord has come. He is to help the three Hebrew people and the children in the fiery furnace. Now he's here to help Daniel. And I'm going to tell you something, friends, we need to always remember this wonderful God has his angels watching over us. And God is watching over his people and he's caring for us. What are we told? Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Matthew and, and Psalm 91, verse 11. Uh, that, uh, that he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And so here the God's wonderful angel. I wonder how many times he's helped me, how many times he's helped you, but in the same breath, same breath. He may not deliver you. And we think of the persecuted church where God is not protecting his people, but they're dying for him. And when you take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses, verse 33, this is what these people are happening. These are believers, Christian people, who through faith they subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. But Jen took a just third verse 33. Now look at verse 37. Same to Hebrew, book of Hebrews, same chapter, same people, people of God, people of trusting God, loving God. Listen to this 37th verse. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. These were people of great faith too. Some were delivered and some died a violent death. And why? This great, wonderful God tells us why. Because he has a plan and he has a purpose. And we are to submit to that plan like Daniel. And Daniel prayed to God and loved the Lord with all of his heart. Loved God with all his heart. And that's what we have to do.
And I'm thinking, you know, we pray, we pray for the persecuted church every week. We have we pray for some a new person, a new a group of people, different countries. And so, man, when we accept Jesus, we may be delivered like a, uh, we may be delivered like Saint Paul was delivered, or we may be die like Saint Paul was beheaded eventually. And so, it's all in God's hands. And so today, you have to have Jesus. That's the key to it all, that personal relationship with God through Jesus. And so the scripture says, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so when we come to the scriptures, we find that God tells us, I'm, Jesus says, I'm standing at the heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I'll come into your heart. And you say, how can I have him come in? And you just ask him in. And you pray, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I ask you to please come into my heart and take away my sin. And I'll turn from my sin the best I can. And I'll serve you as less best I can. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you make that prayer, you write to us at the Christian Worship Hour. Christian Worship Hour. And the box is 2002. 2002. We're in Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. Or if you want to write, uh, you want to get us, you can get us on the internet, christianworshiphour.com. And you, we need to have you to help us. And you can send a gift over the uh, internet or you can send it by, or you can send it through the mail. And if you send a gift, we'll be very careful in the usage of it. We're a member of the organization, the International Council, uh, we're uh, Evangelical Council for our, uh, Christian Accountability. And we will have our books audited and checked every time so that you will, every penny you send will go exactly where it needs to go. So we're going to pray now for all of you that are accepting the Lord, be sure to write. And we're going to pray for the persecuted church, Saudi Arabia. So Heavenly Father, we're just praying today that you'll be with your people in Saudi Arabia. We know you will. And just get, and help us, Lord, to see and uh, as they live for you and die for you, help us that we'll be willing to do the same thing, that we'll be people that love you so much we'll give our life. And help us, dear, dear Lord, I'm praying that you'll speak with your people. Help them to write, those that accept Jesus, we'll send, we can send literature to them, dear Lord. So just we put everything in your hands. Pray for the sick, pray for the lonely, pray for the children and the young people. And pray that your name will be honored in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again now, you can write to us, Christian Worship Hour, Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. We need your prayers and we need your help. And like James says, you have not because he asked not, so we're asking you to help us. For almost 40 years now, we're in our 40th year, we've, God has always provided and he's provided only one source, that's God's people. So we'll be looking for your letter. And all of you, uh, all of you folks on the short wave, it's box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And so we're just praying God will bless you and watch over you. Remember that God loves you and the Christian worship hour loves you. That's why we carry on this ministry for all these years. We want you to come to Jesus. And we want Christian people to find comfort and strength. And we'll find that because we have Jesus. And he's the answer to our every need. So God bless you. God bless you, everyone, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. You've been watching the Christian Worship Hour, the weekly broadcast that brings good news to the lost and encouragement to the believer. We hope that today's program has been a blessing in your life. Support our ministry by contacting us at the Christian Worship Hour, P.O. Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. Or visit us online at christianworshiphour.com. Be sure to join next week for another life-changing message from Pastor Salem.